Hello, welcome back as we continue to walk through this great epistle to the Ephesian church that Paul wrote alongside Romans, the, the pinnacle of his teaching on the gospel. We might just want to recall that Ephesians is divided into two sections, chapter, chapters 1 to 3, which tells the story of the gospel, and chapters 4 to 6, which tells our story in the light of the story of the gospel. God has spoken well of us, so how do we live our lives to speak well of him? Well, we started looking at that in some detail last week as we looked at chapter one, the story of our calling, which is the story of redemption, of adoption, of predestination, and of God's seal on our lives. Paul's great focus is that he has acted to create a new community, a covenant family, that has at its core both forgiveness and grace. It's all about grace. He talks in chapter 1 verse 10 of there being a great cosmic plan. And this is the plan, Paul writes, at the right time he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Things don't happen randomly. Uh, the church wasn't brought into being by chance. It's all part of God's great plan, the plan that he predestined long ago, bringing everything together under the authority of Christ. The unity of this incredibly diverse, culturally mixed community with the twin themes of forgiveness and grace. This is his plan. A huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus the Messiah. And Paul talks about we and you in this new family. We is ethnic Jews and you is Gentiles, from his perspective. Jew and non-Jew in one family under Jesus. Just like God promised to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. Well, in chapter 2 of Ephesians, Paul elaborates on some of the key features of chapter 1, especially God's grace in verse 10 of chapter 1 and the new multi-ethnic family of, of Jesus in uh, verses 11 to 22. How did we come to know Jesus? Well, before people knew him, they were physically alive but spiritually dead. Now, I have uh, a, a, a grandchild, or I have three grandchildren. Uh, the middle one in particular is a really deep thinker. And he, not uh, a, a, a while ago, had a, a real issue with God. This is when he was still just five. <laughs> he said that he didn't believe in Jesus anymore. And when asked why, he said it was because uh, Jesus had lied. Why? Because he said that he would never die. But he did die on the cross, so he wasn't telling the truth, was he? Which is pretty good reasoning for a five-year-old. But of course, the Bible talks about two types of death, physical death and spiritual death. You can be physically alive, yet spiritually dead, because you're living life without knowing Jesus. And so chapter 2 verse 1 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. Actually, this is important because in order to understand who you are in Christ, you need to understand who you were without him. Now in the Bible, death is not so much seen as extinction as separation. Physical death is separation from the of the person from the body. But chapter 2 verse 1 is talking about spiritual death, the separation of us from God. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. All of the things that I was mentioning uh, 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 two weeks ago, two sessions ago, purposelessness, selfishness, deception, sin... Now, amazingly, God, in his great love and grace, saved them. He forgave all their sins and he joined their lives to Jesus' resurrection life. And he has brought them back to life to discover the new purposes and tasks that he's got for them. Not only have these people been shown God's grace, they've also been invited into a new family. 
Before hearing about Jesus, non-Jewish people were not only cut off from God, they were cut off from his people, the family of Abraham. So verse 2, the way of a lot of the way that a lot of versions put uh, chapter 2 verse 2 uh, is that you used to live in sin. But the Greek word here really means walk. You used to walk in sin. It's not so much that it, only that every word and every action was sinful, so much as the direction you were traveling, the way in which you were walking, showed that you were separate from God. That makes you like the walking dead. And then verse 3, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. So it's not just about individual actions, it's what we were following after. It was a direction of our walk. And as a result, all of us were subject to God's anger. We all deserve the end result of being out of relationship with God. Now, how do we make that right? If we deserve separation, how can we be invited into relationship with him and be a part of that amazing multi-ethnic community? Well, one word, grace. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved says Paul in chapter 2, verse 5. Right in the middle of us sinning against him, and because he loved us so much, he saved us. That is grace. But grace goes further. It's even more amazing than re reconnecting us with God. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 6. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. That's saying that having been saved, we are already seated in heaven. Now, how can that be? Because my reality is that I'm still very much here on earth, very much struggling with real earthly things, very much failing and, and struggling right here. How can I be seated in heaven and still be here on earth? Well, the picture of being seated is about being at rest, at home, relaxed, secure. Right now, it is the case that the physical realm and the spiritual realm are out of sync. They're not, they're not together. Though one day God will bring the spiritual and the physical realities completely together at the second coming, when he'll reign for a thousand years from his throne in Jerusalem. Right now, our physical home is here on earth, but our spiritual home, our true home, is in heaven. Now, why does God seat us right now in heaven? Well, for a purpose. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all that he's done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. That's verse 7 of chapter 2. We can marvel at a, a beautiful sunset, a, a breathtaking mountain scene, the pictures that are brought to us of the galaxies uh, out in space by, by various telescopes. But all that will go when God wants to point to the ultimate example of his artistry. What he's going to point to is us, the trophies of his grace the jewels in the crown of his grace. For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do, says verses 8 to 10. You were saved, forgiven, brought from death to life by grace. Don't deserve it, can't earn it, just because God loves you, grace. That word handiwork in, in verse 10 of chapter 2 really doesn't capture what's being talked about here. 
it sounds like, and I mean no disrespect to those who are good at constructing things with their hands, but it sounds like something has been constructed. But the Greek word for handiwork used here is poema, poema. That's where we get the word poem, a work of art, a masterpiece. God is an artist and he expresses himself, tells his story through his art. And that's us. We are his artistic masterpiece, the story of his grace, the work of art that he is going to point to for all future ages as the ultimate expression of his artistry. We're his poem. Trophies of grace all, all, already there in the artistic masterpiece of heaven, but being shaped, fashioned and moulded through our life here on earth. How do we get to be shaped, fashioned and moulded? We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I'm spiritually already in heaven, already part of the poem of the Father. And through rising to the challenges of these good works, I am adding a richness and a detail to my part of that poem in heaven. You remember the subject of predestination that we looked at in the last episode of uh, uh, this series on Ephesians? Predestination means the path that God has marked out for us. Well, this is that path. It end, its end result is that we become fully the handiwork, the poem of God. Well, lots of people who aren't part of God's people get to do good works too. So what's the big deal? Well, yes, they do. But don't forget that this is all about our walk. The walk of the redeemed is different from the walk of the unredeemed. It's humble. It's changed by grace. And just to make sure that we don't forget that and start thinking that it's all about us, Paul takes us back to reality. He says, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. That's chapter 2, verse 12. The Jews had a, a temple where they could come near to God. Gentiles were allowed to, to visit, but they were separated by a dividing wall. That dividing wall really symbolizes the division that religion can bring. But the amazing plan of grace is that Jesus Christ brings people together. He tears down walls that divide. Religion may try to rebuild those walls, but Jesus came to bring people together in him. You know, the church is unlike any other grouping of people in the world because it's not a grouping of people who are just trying to be different or to live better lives or who have similar interests. The church is very different. The church is a place of grace where people are given a whole new identity. And Paul highlights four aspects of that new identity. Firstly, we're under new ownership. As he says, once you were dead, doomed forever because of your many sins, obeying Satan, following the passions and desires of our evil nature. And the word he uses for sin here is interesting. It's the Greek word hamartia. And it literally means missing the mark. You shoot an arrow at a target and the arrow misses. That's hamartia. Hamartia is the failure to hit the target of life. And that's why all have sinned and fallen short of, God's, uh, of the glory of God. Even if we're nice people, sin is not about uh, killing as many people as possible with the arrow. It's failing to hit the right target. It doesn't matter how straight we fire the arrow. If we're not under new ownership, we're not aiming at the right target. We're dead and doomed forever because, our many, because of our many misses of the target, our many hamartia, our many sins. But we've come under new ownership. 
We have the Lord Jesus Christ directing our lives now. He's directing the aim of the arrow now. So we're hitting the right target. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so very much that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, then you have a new identity. You're no longer trying your best but missing the mark. Your new identity is that you are a child of God, one of the most special group of people in the universe, a trophy of his grace. Now, why is it important to know that? Because authority comes out of identity. How you act in the world, which Paul turns to in chapter 4 um, and 5 and 6, comes out of what you know to be true about yourself. Many Christians view themselves as ordinary or failures or essentially no different from those who aren't Christians. But you are. You're under new ownership. You are a child of God. That's the first of those four points. The second aspect of our new identity that Paul highlights is that we're already living in a new location. Paul says, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms all because we are one with Christ Jesus. Now, as I said earlier, how can we be seated with him in the heavenly realms if we're still paying taxes here on earth? The key to understanding this is that we are seated with him in the heavenly realms. We are in Christ. And so where Christ is, so spiritually speaking, are we. Our true home is in heaven. That absolutely affects our priorities. It also affects our understanding of how God sees us. We often think he only sees our failures and our imperfections. But in fact, God sees us as we are in Christ Jesus. He sees our potential. He sees us in our perfect state, the person that we can become. So far as God is concerned, we are already seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. It's a done deal. And there's, an, and there's another reason why that is rather another reason why you can't lose your salvation. And if that's the case, which it is, then as Peter says, friends, this world is not your home. So don't make yourself cosy in it. Don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Our true home is in heaven. And so far as God is concerned, we're already occupying it if we're in Christ Jesus. Well, the third aspect of our, our new identity that Paul highlights in this section of the letter to the Ephesians is that we've been given a new source of wealth. You know, one way of asking how much money someone has is to ask, how much are you worth? Or to find out how much a house costs, you probably ask, well, how much is that house worth? If the housing market is at its peak, the answer to how much is that worth will be very different than if we're in a recession and the housing market has collapsed. We measure worth in a very fickle way. What is a footballer worth? 50 million? 100 million? What are you worth? How large is the source of your wealth? Well, here's Paul's estimation. And so God can always point to us as examples of the incredible wealth of his favour and kindness towards us, as shown in all that he's done for us through Christ Jesus. Our worth has been assessed at the level of the life of the Son of God. Now, if wealth is determined by what we're worth, then we are very wealthy people. Not perhaps in worldly terms, but in terms that really count, in kingdom terms. We're worth a great deal. We're a community of very wealthy people, and we can go on accumulating that wealth regardless of world recessions and stock market collapses. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, says Peter, on just this subject, 
where they will never become moth-eaten or rusty and where they, they will be safe from thieves. When we serve each other and reach out to the wider community with the love of God as a reflection of the incredible wealth of his favour and kindness towards us, we are accumulating wealth in heaven. That's why great community thrives when we know who we are. Then thirdly, says Paul, in, in terms of those four um, aspects of identity, because, because we have a new identity, we can draw on a new source of self-esteem. You know, if you're worth that much, if God looks at you and sees you as someone to bestow the incredible wealth of his favour and kindness on, then that has to have an impact on your self-esteem. How can God see such potential in us and yet we see only the failures and the disappointing bits? You know, God saved you by his special favour when you believed and you can't take any credit for this. It's a gift from God. That leads to a right self-esteem whereby we recognise our worth but also recognise that there is nothing within our human nature that impresses God or makes us any better than anyone else. Now this is a really big verse. We have been saved by grace through faith. And you know what that leads to? Humility. I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. Grace always leads to humility. This is so vital in God's new community because what destroys community faster than anything else is pride, which manifests itself in selfishness. If we believe that somehow we're more deserving than other people, or indeed less deserving than other people, that, that we're more important or less important than other people, then community begins to break down. Actually, each person in God's community is an irreplaceable masterpiece, a poema, but only because of what Christ has done for us. We are God's masterpiece, says Paul. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. And actually, that verse contains a major key to spiritual growth. It concerns our identity in Christ. One author, Neil Anderson, in his book, Victory Over Darkness, says that there is a great tension in the New Testament between what he calls the indicative, that is to say what God has already done and what's already true about us, and what he calls the imperative, that is what remains to be done as we respond to God by faith and obedience in the power of the Holy Spirit what God's already done and what remains to be done. He says that in the Bible, the balance between these two is about equal, but that in church in general, we tend to focus almost exclusively on the imperative, i.e. that which remains to be done. He says that, and I quote, we need to hear again and again the wonderful identity and position we already have in Christ then we will be better prepared to receive instructions and assume our responsibilities for living the Christian life. And that's what Paul's focusing on when he says we are God's masterpiece, his poema. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. We need to understand and believe that that is what has already happened. And who we are, uh, and, and rather who we already are. We don't one day become God's masterpiece, we already are. We don't one day become new people in Christ, we already are new people in Christ. So we're not in danger of missing out on our inheritance as children of God. That's already been accomplished. And it's only as we absolutely take that on board that we are able to, to take hold of the second part of that verse, which is so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You know, so many of us try to do the things he's planned for us in order to convince ourselves that we are God's masterpiece and that we are indeed new creations. 
to try to do things that, that way round is just doomed to failure. Everything comes out of identity. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. We are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. It's all about grace. Grace saved us. Grace united us. Grace seated us in heaven. Grace gave us a new identity in Christ. This is the gospel. The gospel of grace. So Lord, I pray for all of those of us who struggle particularly with our sense of identity. I am only me. I don't feel special. I'm an imposter. If only people knew the truth about me, I would be rejected. No, you are a masterpiece. You are God's poem, his poema. You are seated in heaven. You have a new identity in Christ. We are God's masterpiece. And that is not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, but because of his grace. It's all about grace. God's unmerited riches to those who don't deserve it. His grace. And Lord, out of that understanding of our identity comes everything else. All of the good works that we do, all of the way in which we live our lives, it all comes out of knowing our true identity. I am a trophy of grace. I am seated with Christ in heaven. I am God's poem, his masterpiece. Oh Lord, I pray that you would take those words and plant them deep in our hearts that we would know that, that not just at a, an intellectual level, but really know and understand and be transformed by the knowledge of who I already am in Christ, a recipient of God's amazing grace. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Wow. Well, I really hope that... Uh, that those words have impacted you. They certainly impacted me as I was writing them and, and, and delivering them. So I hope you can join us next time as we continue through this wonderful letter that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. And uh, in the meantime, may you live as a trophy of God's grace. May you understand and know in your inner being that you are already his masterpiece. You are already seated in heaven in Christ. And out of that, out of that revelation, may you live and work to his praise and glory. So until I see you again next time, may God bless you.